Now I'm gonna go ahead and warn those of you who are visiting, just like I warn them when, when I go out. So you'll have an expectation, okay? I might call Matthew Mark. I might say, turn to Matthew and mean turn to Ezekiel. I might call you Penelope and your name might be Jennifer. But we'll get it together after a while. Amen. Go ahead and put that out there. All right. We're going to be reading verses 32 through 37. And when they were come unto a place called... And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, no, go on back, I want to start reading now. <laughs> and when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of skulls, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments Casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is the king of the Jews. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, most holy and righteous God, we come before you, O oh Lord, and we just say thank you for this Resurrection Sunday where we have come together in this place to hear what it is you have to say concerning the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your son. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you loved us, so much that you had a plan for us. Even when we rejected you, even, Lord, when this world was without a God and did not care about having a God, you still had a plan to bring us back to yourself. You still had a desire to call us your children and for us to call you Father. Lord God, we thank you right now that you have brought us here. We thank you, God, that we have victory because of the cross. We thank you, Lord God, that we can still say right now, oh, death, where is your sting? We thank you, Lord God, that you took the sting out of death and you took the victory out of the grave. Now, Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would have your way in this place. Let no flesh glory in your sight. Lord God, none of me but all of you. For, Father, I am nothing but a vessel of clay. I'm marred. I'm bruised. Lord God, I'm imperfect. Lord God, I am not like you. So I need you, Lord God, to supernaturally step into this vessel so that the people of God will hear and see you and not me. Hallelujah, Lord God, speak to us and let the word that come forth out of my mouth be anointed and be clear, full of wisdom, full of light, Father God, that we might walk in the assurance of who you are and of who your son is and who we are because of your plan, oh God. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. We thank you for the Holy Ghost on today who is here abiding with us right now. We thank you, O oh God, that the angels of the Lord are here ready and prepared to minister to us wherever it is that we may be. We thank you, God, that the answers are already in the room. We love you, God, but we understand that it is you who loves us with an everlasting love. So we say thank you. Hallelujah. Hide me behind the cross. Hide me under the blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Minister Liss, I will give you this so you can write this down so you won't have to ask me later. Amen. Um, for those of you who are taking notes, this message today is entitled, The Promise is Not Dead. Come on, somebody look at your neighbor and say, The Promise is Not Dead. And my subtitle, is the plan has not been abandoned. My title is The Promise is Not Dead, and my subtitle is The Plan Hasn't Been Abandoned. Now, we look here in the book of Matthew, and we come upon a scene. Mm -hmm. 
the scene, if you could just picture it in your mind, Jesus has already gone through the persecution. He's already been betrayed. They've already had the Last Supper. All of these things has already taken place. He's already been in the Garden of Gethsemane where he has to struggle with his human will as opposed to God's divine will. He has submitted to the will of the Lord and now we find here that Jesus is on the cross. And it said that, glory to God, that they were standing and they were watching all of these things as they took place in verse 36. It says, and sitting down, they watched him there. Who were they talking about? Were they just talking about uh, the individuals who had persecuted him? Or were they just talking about the individuals who had sacrificed him? Were they just talking about the individuals who were there to view a crucifixion? Or were they also talking about those who believed that Jesus was the one? There were those who were standing there that had believed that Jesus was the one, that he was the one that the prophets had spoken about that was going to come and save the world. Now, I want you to understand because I've got to give you just a little bit of history. The Jews believed that Jesus was going to come and he was going to overthrow the government. They believed that Jesus' coming was not spiritual, but they believed that it was political, and they believed that he was going to come and he was going to give them territory. They believed he was going to change their social status. They believed he was going to come and change their economic status. They believed that he was going to come and there was going to be an uprising and that he was going to raise up this mighty and this powerful army that was going to overthrow the Roman government and all who came unjustly to the people of God. Mm -hmm. But yet and still, with all of these things that they believe, they're looking at a dying Messiah. Ah. They're looking at a dying Messiah. Though, what is a Messiah? A Messiah is a deliverer. A Messiah is a leader. He is a savior of a group or a cause. So now, these individuals are standing here and they said, this is supposed to be the Messiah, but the promise that was written of in the prophecies is dying. Will he come up, will, will he snatch himself up off of this cross? When, when is the moment going to arrive? When is the climax of the story going to appear? Because we believe that he was going to be the one. And it had to be a vexation of spirit as they were looking at the signage over his head that was a mockery, Jesus, the king of the Jews. For this is what they believed he would be. It was a reminder to them that what their expectation was, was dying. Mm -hmm. I believe that he was coming to make my life better. I believe he was coming to make everything okay. I believe that he was coming to take away the suffering of my family and my people. But yet and still, I'm looking at a dead promise. Bleeding out. Suffering. And it says, the king of the Jews. So this is the scene. Now I want to transition to the expectation. The expectation as we saw. They expected Jesus to come and overthrow the government. They expected Jesus to do so many things. But why did they expect these things? Well, because it was written of our Savior in the Old Testament say, he didn't just show up in the New Testament. Come on, look at somebody and say, he just didn't show up in the New Testament. But he was prophesied of in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I want you to write down Micah, Micah chapter 5. For those of you who can turn with me quickly, let's go. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, or Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, 
to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Mm -hmm. They were expecting something. Go to Genesis chapter 49. If you guys can get it on the screen, let me know that you've got it there, and I'll use that. Genesis chapter 49 and 10. Hallelujah. Let's look at it. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until him shall the gathering of the people be. Y'all see that? Mm hmm Now, I thought it important to look up the word scepter because the scepter means a mark of authority. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 my, in Micah, we find that the expectation according to the scripture is that he would be a ruler. In Genesis 49 and 10, for those who were scholars and who were learned and those who had been expecting what the prophecy said, he was supposed to come as a mark of authority. Now I want you to turn to Isaiah 9. Turn to Isaiah 9, verse 6 through 7. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Amen. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be where? What's going to be on his shoulder? The government. And his name shall be called, come on and let's read that together, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So according to Isaiah 9, they were expecting him to be the bringer of peace. Now I want you to turn to Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Hallelujah, God. I'm going to go ahead and read that one. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. So here in this particular scripture we see him as king and savior. He's coming as a savior. And so these individuals are looking for Jesus to come to be a ruler. They're looking for him to come with authority. They're looking for him to come with power. They're looking for him to come as a peace bringer. But yet again, y'all ever watch the movies where um, it says present? Then it goes back and says 250 days earlier. <laughs> Here they're looking at the present, but they're remembering what was written. Yes. Six, seven. Listen, Jesus didn't just come up on the scene. It was written of him thousands of years earlier, hundreds of years earlier. It was prophesied that he was coming and that he was coming with power and that he was coming to deliver and he was coming to his people. Yes. But the Bible says that hurt defer hope deferred makes the heart sick. Could you just imagine how these individuals felt looking at their dreams die? If I could talk about you for just a minute, I could just imagine how some of you feel having dreams and, and having plans and, and thinking that God was going to come and show up in your life one way. 
And it looks like the thing that you had believed God was going to do in your life was dying right in front of you. Mm -hmm. You thought God was going to show up. You, you thought God was going to come and, and, and make you a business owner. You thought God was going to show up and you thought he was going to cause you to be the CEO of the company. You thought by now you would be married. You thought by now something different would be happening for your life because you had a plan for your life. You had a plan for the Messiah. Wow. You said, I'm going to accept Jesus because I have a plan for him. Not that he had a plan for me, but I got a plan for him. There is a particular way that I see him coming and saving me. There is a way that I say he's going to come and deliver me, but it better look the way I need it to look, because if it don't look the way I need it to look, then what's going to end up happening is I'm going to reject him. If he don't show up like I need him to show up, if he don't show up, hallelujah, causing me, to be the head and not the tail when I need on, him to. If he don't show up and give me come the on. expectation of my life, if he give me that busted Pinto instead of giving me that Lexus, then he must not be the one. Come on, well, come on, somebody. If, if he don't bring me tall, dark, and handsome, and instead he bring me short and, 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 and stumpy and broke, come must on. not be the plan of God. He must not be real. He, he must not be the one. I must need to look for another. Mm -hmm. Because there was an expectation that I had when I said yes to the son. Ah, uh, yeah. So you got to understand when the disciples said that they would follow after Jesus, they dropped everything. But they didn't just drop everything because they was expecting nothing. Come on, somebody. When they dropped everything, they dropped everything with an expectation. You don't leave your nets and your boats and your career and your promises and your future. You don't leave all of that stuff unless you believe that the thing, the person you're getting ready to follow behind has a plan for your life. I don't know about you, but when I came after Jesus, I came because I loved him. I've always loved God. I just didn't know his son. Come on, somebody. All my life, I loved God. All my life, I loved the Father, but I didn't have a clear understanding of who his son was. So my expectation of God was warped. But when I finally came to understand who God was and my connection to his son, hallelujah, it came to be a point where it didn't matter the direction of my life. Yes. It got to the point that it really didn't matter to me what my life looked like, whether I had water or I didn't have water. I could have food or didn't have food. It really didn't matter to me. I could have a car. It didn't matter if I didn't have a car. It didn't matter if I had beans and weenies. It didn't matter if I had steak and potatoes. It didn't matter if I had duty and birth. It didn't matter if I... It didn't matter what I had because all I wanted was God. Yes. And so God is trying to get all of us to the point that we don't care about what that looks like. Because we have to understand that our expectation of what having God looks like is much more small than what his plan is for your life. I'm almost done, believe it or not. Now let's look at the truth of the matter. We talked about the scene and we talked about the, the, the expectation. Now we're going to go to the truth. Uh-huh. Mm. Here we have, they saw, they saw him as the sit deliverer who would come and overthrow the unjust rulers. He was going to uproot the kingdoms that were established and he was going to bring peace and justice for the downtrodden. But the truth is, isn't that what he came and done? <laughs> isn't that exactly what he did? It just didn't look like. You know why it didn't look like? what they thought it was going to be because it was bigger than what they could imagine. Yes. Well, ah, God Almighty. It was different than what they expected because they were fleshly and because they were human and because they could not fathom the greatness of the plan of God. Yeah. Right. Yes, Lord. So I have to ask this question as I was preparing this message. I had to ask the question, but God, as I looked at the scriptures that testified of who Jesus was going to be and how he was going to show up as ruler, as king, as the one holding authority in his hand, as the one who was going to be deliverer, 
Did they not also see the scriptures that said he was going to suffer? Did they not also see the scriptures that said he was going to be rejected? What did they do with the scriptures that said he was going to be the lonely, humble servant? That was going to have his garments parted. There's a lot of things that we see in the word of God about what God is going to be and who he's going to be in our life and what he's going to do for us. But it seems as though we have isolated acceptance. Just like the people that I'm talking about now. There was a, they, 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 they chose to believe a certain thing about Jesus. They chose to gravitate to certain things about him. But there were things that was also written about him that they could sit and see for their very selves. But they chose to reject that as truth. They chose to reject that that was a part of God's plan to get them to salvation. You're talking, look, you're talking about Jews who understand God's plan. You're talking about Jews who understand about sacrifice. Okay? You're talking about Jewish people who understand about the Old Testament. They understood about sacrifice. They understood about going into the temple. They understood that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sins. Look at your neighbor and say, no blood, no, blood. no forgiveness. No forgiveness. Uh-huh. With no blood, no, that's Old Testament. That's what, that's what makes us different from the children of Abraham's son, Ishmael. Same God, same father. It's just they have no way for their sins to be forgiven, and we do. Only difference, same father. But we are the children of the free. Come on, somebody said we're the children of the free. And they're the children of the bond woman. Mm -hmm. So I had to ask myself, did they not see Isaiah 53? <laughs> what, what did they do with Isaiah the 53rd chapter? You could turn with me. Isaiah 53 and 8. And it says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. What does that mean? He was going to die. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Guess what? This same thing is in the Quran. Y'all know I've done it all, right? Y'all know I used to be a Muslim, used to make bean pies, right? Okay, so you know I know what it says in the Quran, right? Okay, this same scripture is also in the Quran. Lord, have mercy. But we choose to believe what we want to believe. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Mm -mm -mm. Zechariah. Turn to Zechariah. Ten. We're going to be looking at ten through fourteen. Let's look at what it says. Did y'all see that? I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Laban and, pla a, excuse me, and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with what? With what? Who are they talking about? Come on, talk to me. They're talking about the Messiah. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea and all the depths of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord and they shall 
Walk up and down in his name, said the Lord. Now look at 13. Somebody, somebody look at 13. Read it for me real quickly while I'm trying to get it. 13 and 1. That's all right, I got it. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. But he's talking about the suffering of Jesus. Come on, somebody. It, it, it's almost like we look at the things that God said in his word about where we're going to go and what we're going to enjoy and how we're going to live, but we forget about the part that says that if we suffer with him, we shall also reign. Come on. We can't expect to be what God has called us to be and live, how God has called us to live if we're not willing to suffer, if we're not willing to go through some stuff because even Jesus, the promised Messiah, had to suffer. He had to go through some things. He had to experience some things. Why? Because he's our intercessor. Because the Bible says that he's constantly interceding for us. He sits at the right hand of God the Father and he's always continuously reminding God, Father, I walked in their shoes. You know the Bible says, well, excuse me, you know a lot of times people say you can't uh, you can't judge a man unless you walked a mile in his shoes. But the Bible says that Jesus is the righteous judge. What makes him the righteous judge? Because he walked a lifetime in our shoes. He went through what we went through. He was acquainted with grief. He knew suffering. He understood what it was to be talked about by people that he loved. He knew what it was to be rejected by people that he cared about. He knew what it was to be betrayed by friends like Judas was sitting at the table with him and he said, one of you is going to betray me. But yet and still, he still showed him the same things that he showed to everybody else. He knew what it was, hallelujah, to be standing at a crossroad, having a decision to make, knowing that either he was going to decide to do the will of God, or he was going to save himself the suffering and the pain and the agony of death. He was just like us. He suffered the same You may be suffering hopelessness. You may be suffering hardship. You may 
empire. They were going to grab some brooms and mops and pitchforks. They were going to fight with some cows. <laughs> I mean, what, they was gonna, what was they going to ride on? They had no horses. They had no cherries. They had nothing. Really, what was their expectation? They had no tools. They had no equipment. They had no training. They had nothing to work with. But yet and still, they expected Jesus to make a dollar out of 15 cents. But the truth of the matter is, their expectation was one-dimensional. When Jesus was coming, multi-dimensional. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus was coming with not just power to overthrow a humanistic government, but he was coming to overthrow kingdoms. Yes. Yes. He was coming with a peace, not just the peace so that your children will not be taken from you, and not just the peace that, that, that the Romans would no longer come and tax you, but a peace on the inside so it didn't matter whether or not you had money or not, you had peace on the inside. Come on, somebody. I would rather have peace on the inside than to have a whole bunch of money. Yes. How many of you know that there are people in this world who are rich, got all the money in the world, they got millions and millions of dollars, but they're miserable, snorting cocaine just to be happy, taking drugs because their body's full of pain. Look at, look at Michael Jackson. I love Michael Jackson, but look at Michael Jackson. He had all the money. He had all the money that, that could, he could buy doctors, he could buy lawyers, he could buy cars, he could buy houses, he could buy whatever he wanted to buy, but what he couldn't buy was health. So because his health was failing him, he was taking medication, and he had to take so much medication because he was in so much pain that he lost his life. So they say. I don't know, I ain't getting into conspiracy. I don't know, that ain't my business. <laughs> but I do know he was in pain. But when you're in pain and you're suffering, but you have the peace of God inside of you, you might take some medication, but there's a peace that'll make you feel better than a pill. Amen. Come on, somebody. Yes. Yes. There, there, there's a peace that'll make you feel better than anything that you could take. And I thank, that, I thank God because we all have our trouble. We all have our trials. We all have our struggle. But I thank God that when I can't reach for nothing else, I could reach for the peace of God. Yes, sir. Glory to God. Amen. That's the reason why God gets upset with us when we use other things, hallelujah, as a supplement. It's not that I don't believe that God has a problem with us using some things in the earth, but it's that he wants us to use him first. He wants us to say, God, you're my first go-to. Yes. God, yes. you're my, come on, Carly. God, you're my first go-to. When I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling low, when I feel like my life isn't measuring up and I don't feel like I can cope, God, I turn to you before I turn to the Xanax. I, I turn to you before I turn to the pill. I, I turn to you before I turn to the other things that the world is telling me will fix my problems because these things won't fix my problems. These things only mask my problems. These things only help me forget that I got the problem. But when I no longer am filled with whatever the thing is that I just used to help me get over the problem, I still got the problem and I still ain't got no peace. But when you got peace that passes all understanding, I can look at the problem and tell the problem, don't you realize that I've got a God who's got more power than you. I've got a God, hallelujah, who can overcome you and can overthrow you. I can say thanks be to God who causes us to triumph in his name. He gives us a joy. Hallelujah, that a red bull can't give us. Yeah, I know sometimes we turn to it. I know sometimes we feel overwhelmed and we feel anxious and sometimes we turn to certain things. We, you know, we all got, we all got our addictions. Some of y'all, you know, turn to one thing. Some of us, some of us don't realize it, but red box is your thing. Netflix may be your addiction. Five hour energy may be your addiction. Ain't no different and it ain't no worse than smoking a joint. 
Now, I'm not saying do any of it. <laughs> All right, I'm not, let me fix that up. I'm not condoning any of it. What I am saying is, you can't judge one because all of it makes God angry because we use it as a replacement for him. He wants us to realize he's our deliverer. He is our fortress. He is the one who gives joy. Not only did he bring them power and peace and joy, he brought healing. But the Bible says that Jesus came and he was preaching the kingdom, healing and delivering. He brought deliverance, he brought wisdom, and he brought brotherhood. Mm -hmm. He did so much more than what they were expecting out of him. Mm -hmm. They thought, and I'm closing, they thought that Jesus wasn't cut out for the job. But I want to close with this one statement. But the truth of the matter is, the job was too small for what Jesus was cut out for. Yes. <laughs> Stand to your feet, I'm done. They thought that Jesus wasn't cut out for the job. But the truth is, the job was too small for what Jesus was purposed for. He came as a part of the heavenly plan. Brother Rashad, daddy had a plan. He had a plan, really. And the plan don't look like human plan. Because the way we would do it will always go opposite what God would do it. You know, sometimes we tell God, God, I want you in my life. But this is the way I want my life to look. Because I know what you don't know, Father. Because after all, isn't this my life? And shouldn't I know what my life should look like? Shouldn't I know? Come on, get with the program, God. Isn't that what John was telling Jesus? Come on, get with it. Come on and, and make my life look the way I need my life to look. I want to be a nurse, and God said, but you being a nurse won't look like what your life's going to look like as a teacher. Because if you're a nurse, See, understand, God has already gone, I tell y'all this all the time, God's already gone before you, and he's seen all of your outcomes, right? Because God stands in eternity, and he looks in time. Y'all y'all, y'all ever seen the Avengers? Seen Dr. Strange? Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Dr. Strange, he's standing, he's looking at all the possible outcomes. And they said to him, how many times do you see us winning? What does he say? One. Out of all the possible futures, there's only one where you win. The Father who created you sees the one. And the one will never have anything to do with your plan. Because all of the other schemes and all of the other ways that you can come up with to bring you to your expected end will cause you to lose. That's why the Messiah had to die. Because if he had to come any other way, any other way, we wouldn't be where we are today. Come on, lift those hands to the Lord. God, we thank you for being so sovereign. We thank you for being so awesome, Father, in all of your ways. First of all, we want to ask you to forgive us, God, for trying to cause you to conform to our way of thinking, trying to get you to conform to our way of seeing things. We thank you, God, that you are committed to the plan for our lives. We thank you that you gave us a Savior who died and who rose on the third day with all power 
and who turned around and gave that power unto man. A power to have peace, a power to have joy, a power to be healed, a power to cast out poverty, a power to have good relationships and make good decisions. God, we thank you for the Holy Ghost power that you've given to us. And we thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to rule inside of us, to abide inside of us, to guide us and to lead us in the way that we should go. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your son Jesus to die, who being equal with God, counted it not robbery to die for us. Even though he despised the cross and the shame, yet and still for the hope and for the joy that he saw set before him, he suffered unto death. Lord God, let us not get caught up in the hoopla of the commercialism of Easter. But let us, Lord God, walk out of this place today knowing that the reason why we celebrate, the reason why we have joy and an expectation of this day is all because of the life that you have created for us. We understand, Lord God, that it is only because you sacrificed your son that we have victory. And we thank you, Lord God, that when we leave this earth, when we leave this plane, we don't die. But we begin to live. We, we, we live only for a little while on this earth. And we only live for a little while, oh God, in this temporary vessel. But God, you have an eternity for us. Thank you, God, that we don't have to believe the lie that we're just here and then we die and then we're nothing. But God, we thank you for eternal life. We thank you, Lord God, that we're going to live eternally with you. And we're going to live eternally with your son. And we're going to live eternally in the new Jerusalem, Lord God, where there will be no more crying, where there will be no more weeping. There'll be no more wars and rumors of war, Lord God, but we will be able to behold our Savior who is going to be the life of the city. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank you. Thank you that we have a unique, unique situation in believing in your Son, and that is of eternal life. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless each and every person who's here. We ask you to bless their lives, bless their families. Help them, Lord God, to see that even when things are not going the way they envision it, that the plan has not been aborted. Help them to understand that the promises that you have for their life, they're not dead. They're not dead. They're just transformed. But God, I thank you for helping us to grow more and more. Help us to grow closer to you. Help us to have a desire for you. Help us to have a desire for your son. Help us to love one another more. Help us to gravitate one or more, uh, more to one another, to call each other, to text one another, to check on one another, to draw closer as a church family. I thank you, God, that our horizontal and our vertical relationships are lining up with your will. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You are dismissed from this place, but never this present. And anybody who wants to bless their pastors with a meal.